Hi, child of God, you are welcome to Believers Global TV. On this channel, we create Christian content that will help you in your spiritual growth, ranging from powerful Word of God, powerful prayer sessions, night videos, and many more. All the content that we create on this channel are purely Christian content, and I encourage you, if you're a believer, subscribe to this channel. He said they go from strength to strength, every one of them in Zion that appeared before the Lord. Times of refreshing, the Bible says, cometh from the presence of the Lord. Can you ask him for refreshing tonight? Can you ask him for strength? Ask him to, to speak to your heart, to inspire you, to take you to higher levels of glory. We've been so blessed already by the many ministers that have come. Or can you ask the Lord for yet another dimension? Talk to the Father. Make it personal. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, precious Lord. We bless you. We give you glory. We've come again to receive. We ask that you saturate us. We ask that you fill us afresh. We ask that you shift us to higher levels of glory by your word and by your spirit. We ask that you strengthen us. Bring us into higher pedestals in the spirit where we represent your interest, your government, and advance the frontiers of your kingdom. Tonight is that night where the waters will be stirred and we will draw from the everlasting fountains of your spirit. Lord, we come hungry, we come with passion, we come with expectations. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because we know that all that we desire and much more you will do. We give you all the glory, we give you all the praise. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, you may be seated. I'm tempted to sing, but when I saw the timer, <laughs> glory to Jesus. Tonight, I want to just share with us very briefly on the two rivers that we are expected to allow flow out of our vessels. The magnitude of investment of God in the human spirit cannot be quantified. In my study of scripture, I came to realize that the zenith of God's creative enterprise is demonstrated in the human vessel. When you study the angelic ranking, you find a lot of glory. The splendor is unimaginable. But you see, the vastness of what God has installed in the human vessel surpasses everything in the angelic order. The reason you are easily wowed about the angelic realm is because the glory of the angelic is external. And so when you find some angels, they glow like diamonds. Some glow like flames of fire. Some angels are giants. When they stand on the earth, their head pierces through the cloud. It's a phenomenon civilization. However, none of that compared to what is in man because in man is the fullness of God. The Bible said, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And I, I discovered the reason God decided to hide the glory of man is because if that glory is manifested, you'll be tempted to worship man because the fullness of God dwells in man. In fact, when God decided to manifest visibly, the only vessel he took upon himself was man. So in all of God's creation, the only habitation that could host the fullness and the totality of God was the human vessel. In fact, God asked the question. He said, where is the house that you have made for me? Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. That means there's nothing in creation that can host God. But when God decided to manifest, he said he pleased the Father that the fullness of the Godhead should dwell in Christ. And Christ took upon himself the human form. And so there is something about man that has not been understood. And so in this conference, we trust the Lord to help us pipe into the rivers that are in our spirits so that they can find expression. Glory to God. It is my desire that at the end of this conference, all of us will live here as entities of wonder that we wow our generation and manifest the excellency of God's glory in the name of Jesus. Genesis chapter 1 from verse 26. The Lord was speaking to himself. You know, there are times, I was sharing with my people 
on Sunday and I told them there are works that God delegates to angels. But there are certain works that God does himself. Creation is one of them. You can't delegate that assignment to any being because nobody has the blueprint. In fact, the codes are locked in the Godhead. Only God knows it. Creation is one of it. Redemption is another. These assignments, you can't, de you can't delegate them. Only God can do them. Because we we're dealing with a subject, people ask questions. They say, God is not married. How can God have a son? You, have you heard such things before? <laughs> you know, essentially speaking, God is one being. But in manifestation, he takes three forms. Because he has an administration that only him can actualize. So God has to manifest in different forms so that God can run God's errand. <laughs> in order for God to run God's errand. Because if you send an angel to create, an angel will become creator. So when the way God works is, God is sitting. And when God speaks, you know, I'm talking, you are hearing sound. But when God speaks, the voice of God walks. The Bible said in Genesis 3.8, it said the voice of God came walking in the garden. So when God speaks, it's not volume. When God speaks, the voice of God is a person. So the God that sits on the throne, who originates the voice, is called Father. The one that goes out to walk is called Son. So it's not about wife and husband. It's a, a separation that is captured within spiritual intelligence. You, you don't have to marry to have a child. Even in biology, we know that Amoeba can divide into two. And both is the same. Are you following this? So, the, the, the mysteries are much. Now, when God wanted to extend his possibilities outside of himself, he decided to create an entity that will mirror him. And that was when man came into the scene. And so in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God speaking, he said, let us make man. In our own image after our likeness and so when you want to find God outside of God the only place you should trace him is a man let us make man in our own image after our likeness and so too much is locked into the human vessel one of our major responsibilities as we walk through time is to tap into the frequency of our inner man and draw out the resources of God that is locked there. But you see, this assignment is not wished. It's a responsibility. And that's why the theme of the conference is let the river flow. Because greatness is not for irresponsible people. You have to let the river flow. First Thessalonians 5.5, 5, he said, you are the children of light. So every one of us here is light, but not everyone shines. For you to shine, Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine. Because you were born to shine. He was a burning and a shining light. So if you don't take responsibility, you can't manifest. So the call of this conference, first of all, is to show you who you are. And to show you how to release what you carry. If you don't know who you are, you can't release what you carry. And if you know who you are, then you take responsibility to release what you carry. So you have not come to this conference except as you begin to understand man from another dimension. Because some of the things we know about ourselves is what circumstance told us. But I came to tell you what your designer said. Because the one who knows you best is the one who sculpted you. He said you were fearfully and wonderfully made. In Ephesians 2.10, it said, we are God's craftsmanship. We were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. I came to tell you by the authority of scripture that everything you have gone through is a mirage. That's not who you are. The identity you command is the one God said. And by the time we are done routing what God said, then we will find out what to do in order to manifest what God said. Because everyone seated here. Listen. You are not supposed to do your best. You are supposed to manifest God. Because what you call your best may not be good enough. But when you manifest God, it will be well enough. Because somebody can say he's doing his best 
His best is at the level of his education. His best is at the level, like God's servant was sharing, at the level of help that he has received from men. All of that is good. But when God created us, he wanted us to manifest him. So when God comes, he's not primarily looking for your best. He's looking for himself in what you are doing. You are supposed to manifest God in everything you do because the raw material for your making is God. He said we were created in Christ Jesus unto every good works. God breathed out of his spirit and the man became a living soul. So you are supposed to give expression. That's why Paul said, henceforth, know we, no man after the flesh. You carry something that your generation is looking for. And until that thing manifests, whatever you are doing is not good enough. There are many people doing great things, but there's no God's signature there. That is not good enough. Until God can be seen through you, you have not begun to exist. And this conference is designed to make sure that the God dimension in you begins to find expression. Now, when I looked at the scripture, I saw some of the records of the patriots. And I told myself, this thing we are doing, is either it's a joke, or we have not understood what God is expecting. Because the testimony of this man is so supernatural that if we are not careful in our generation, the Bible will be called a book of fairies. We will make the scripture look like fairy tales because our disadvantage will make it look as if what was said in time past were not true. And when people read the Bible, they will say they are fictions. Because the only reason they will believe what was said 2,000 years ago is if we can manifest it now. So the same way the Bible is a witness, you too are a witness. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and be witnesses unto me. So on one side, the world witness. On another side, we are also witnesses. But we can't witness until the rivers begin to flow. Romans 15 verse 4, he said, the things that were written aforetime, he said, they were written for our land. So that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Before I show you the rivers of your spirit, let me show you some of the things that were manifested before you came. Because if you are not careful, you will think what you are offering is all God has to offer. A generation has demonstrated something before we came. And as far as God's calendar is concerned, we should manifest superior dimensions. Because it's from glory to glory. If we can manifest what they have manifested, then we are in trouble already. This is why everybody here must become dangerously deliberate about manifesting God. Genesis 14, verse 14 to 15, we saw the life of Abraham. One man had 318 trained servants. What economic structure was he working with? That was a city in one man's hands. Those were servants. And they had enough to train servants. Today we are struggling with one nanny. We can't pay our children's school fees. And we are serving the same God. There is something we don't understand. Abraham was going to fight against four kings with servants he trained in his house they had competence that was superior to armies trained by four different nations because he was not just working with principles he had mysteries if you read verse 15 of that scripture the bible said and abraham divided himself among men so the people who went to war were not 318 servants plus abraham there were 319 Abrahams. He had the technology. He divided himself among men. A theologian can say they grouped themselves into four. That's not what the Bible is saying. This was a technology of priesthood that Abraham caught. God told him, I will bless you and make you a great nation. And from you, nation shall be born. So Abraham knew he was not a man. Abraham knew that worst case, he was a nation. 
So if Abraham put himself in you, then you too become a nation. That's why there was no record that there was casualty. Because it was 319 nations against four nations. What did the man know? Where did he enter in God that made him wield that level of power? And here we are struggling with people who are inconsequential and we call it warfare. What battles are we fighting? One man stood up without any prior information. They have arrested your nephew Lot. Four kings have taken him. Hey, stand up. 318 servants stood up and they went to battle. Defeated them and came back. When the king wanted to gift him, he said, no, I won't take a latchet from you. Lest you say you made Abraham rich. My wealth comes from yonder. My God supplies my need. I'm richer than the nations of the earth. What did he know? These are the men who came before we showed up. So when you are telling God, this battle is too much. Ten people have gone up against me. Say, ten people. Didn't you read about your fathers? One took four nations who are ten men. That's why he said, surely they shall gather, but it shall not be by me. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, he didn't say God shall condemn. No. He said, thou shall condemn. Thou shall condemn. Because there is something that passes through your spiritual genealogy. One man can take four kings. That's the lineage we come from. We come from a lineage of champions. A man took four nations. And that's not all. After Abraham, Moses showed up. And Moses was trying to do it in the flesh. They said, that's a wrong protocol. Go back to the mountain. There was something Abraham saw. There was a being Abraham encountered. There was a dimension Abraham stepped into. And when Jethro, who is of the descendants of Abraham from Keturah, who understood priesthood, saw that Moses had passion. He told him, this thing is beyond passion. Go and encounter Elohim. And the Bible said Moses went to the backside of the wilderness. There he saw a bush burning that was not consumed. And he said, I will turn aside to see this. And suddenly he heard, take off thy sandals. Where you are standing is holy ground. The mortars walk here. Cherubims walk here. Princes of Zion walk here. This is where Elohim dwells. Take off thy sandals. And immediately he followed the new protocol. And they told him, you don't need extra weapon. The staff you have is enough. Drop it. He dropped it. He became a serpent. Pick it by the tail. He picked it. Go. You have been fortified. What is going on here? The man had been changed. In Exodus 7 verse 1. Behold, I have made thee a god unto Pharaoh. So there are men who are god over other men. I'm telling you true. That's the lineage we come from. The hidden are not our contemporaries. They are our servants. And the guy showed up and shut down the biggest civilization of his era. He comes to Pharaoh. The Lord of the Hebrews have sent me. Let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh thinks it's a joke. Don't worry, you look for me. The next day, a plague shows up. And after the ninth plague, Moses showed up and said, you will not see me again. I come here to see you is a privilege. You will never see me again. And true to his words, he was never seen. And when Moses was leaving, can we celebrate those? <laughs> Suddenly, sir, the visible Shekinah, Exodus 13, 21, began to walk with an ordinary man. God was escorting him out of Egypt. And he said, the pillar of cloud went after him in the day and the pillar of fire by night. The guy shows up before a sea. There was no canoe. That's what we call an emergency. And he turned to the Lord. They said, why are you turning to me? There is something in your hand. Stretch forth your rod. I'm telling you why you must let the river flow. You carry more than enough for any crisis of life. Stretch forth thy rod. When he stretched the rod, he didn't know what was happening in heaven. See, when what is in you moves, heaven moves. And when he stretched the rod, the Bible said, with a blast of his nostrils, he parted the Red Sea. And over four million men walked through on dry ground. And you think that is all. They enter a wilderness. No economic structure. No security structure. How do you sustain four million people? They needed water. Speak to the rock. 
Do rock have ears? As if that is not enough. Their clothes didn't tear. Their shoes grew with them. A child of seven months, they make a shoe. He's 30 years, he's still using the same shoe. Because shoe too has technology of compression and compliance under the glory. That's the heritage we come from. That's why when we tell you our God sustains men, we are not psyching you. There are testimonies in scripture. He said the things that were written aforetime, they were written for our learning. If you can trust God, sir. It's not fairy tale. Men have proven his faithfulness. They proved his faithfulness. And that's not all. You read the chronicles and you keep seeing them. Joshua shows up. Joshua chapter 10 from verse 12 to 14. Fighting in a battle. Joshua saw that when it is night, there will be disadvantage. And the man stood up and said, let the sun stand upon the mountains of Ajalon. Let the moon remain upon the valley of Gibeon. And the Bible said, the man didn't even pray. He was commanding the constellations. The Bible said the sun did not make haste to go down in the day that God hearkened to the voice of a man. If this is the heritage we have received, then it's either we have not known it or what we are doing is a joke. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Over my life, oh Yahweh. Let only you be praised. 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 I read about Samuel. I almost started weeping. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 7, from verse 12, a nation thought Israel was weak. They found where to plunder. And when they, it's time for harvest, they come and loot them. And suddenly, the army was incapacitated and they ran to a prophet. A prophet has no gun. He has no arrow, but he has an altar. The Bible says somewhere erected a stone. What do these people know? He poured oil on it and he called it Ebenezer. And he said, he said to us, the Lord helped us. And the Bible said from that day, the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. And he said even the land that the Philistines took from the Israelites were restored to them up on the Ekron. They began to enter their own corridors because somebody did something on the altar. That's the heritage we have received. What did this man encounter? What has happened? Because these things trouble my spirit. You know what? In the realm of witches, they preserve their heritage. If they tell you witches go for meeting in the night by flight, it's the same 100 years ago, it's the same now. They maintain their heritage. But when we read the stories of the Bible and we compare it with our present situation, it looks as if we are worshipping different gods. Meanwhile, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What is wrong? What is wrong? Why don't we have hunger and appetite for these things anymore? God's servant was sharing concerning Daniel recently. Daniel was in the city of corruption. Babylon is a land of corruption. But the Bible said in Daniel 1.8, he proposed in his heart that he will not be defied by the portion of the king's meat. And there was no corruption there that affected him. Today you meet Christians, even if it's a bucket of water, we fall inside and we drown. Everybody is struggling with every kind of sin. If you talk, they say it's not easy. It's not easy. You, in fact, people don't believe they are righteous men today. When you are talking, they say, oh, more relax. This thing, is no, no, forget those things. It's a lie. As if holiness is now alien to our generation. Meanwhile, the testimony of our fathers is such that they walked through Babylon, they were not defied. So much so that they had to gang up to set him up. Yet the man said he will not bow. And when they were to throw them into the fire, they said, oh king, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. Holiness is unquestionable. 
there's no ground for compromise. If you like, throw us into the fire. Our God is able to save us. But in case he chooses not to, we will still not bow. And because of their witness, the Spirit of God came upon them. In Daniel chapter 5 from verse 11 to 14, when the testimony of Daniel was told, it was not a Christian that wrote the Chronicles. It was the hidden queen that spoke about him. He said, there's a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. He said, light and understanding is in him and he has the power to explain hard sentences. Go and call him. And the guy shows up without reading any book. He began to tell the king parables of the ancients. He said, God showed favor to your father, gave you a kingdom, and you decide to worship the God of Ayo. He said, that's why this hand came. How do you know where the hand came from? Who taught you the language? Where have you been going to? Now we understand the reason he was superior to Babylon. Because he walked in a civilization that was older and more ancient than Babylon. He said, mene, mene. Take care of a sin. He said, your kingdom has been weighed on the balances. Who told you the way men? This is where we are coming from. What we are doing here has a history. What we are doing has a foundation. And there are men who embody the testimonies. That what we are doing is not just religion. We are not fanatics. We have a culture. We have a heritage. We come from a civilization. And we have testimonies to prove the reality and the veracity of that civilization. The names continue unending. Is it Elijah you want to talk about? A man walks to a palace and said, As surely as I live, there shall be no rain or dew except by my word. Do you control weather? And you look at him, you think he's a madman. He walks away. Three months later, you discover he was not bluffing. And the king and all of his servants began to look for Elijah for two years. When they eventually found Elijah, Elijah said, go and tell the king and come in. Obadiah said, God knows I will leave you. Because we know that you don't travel with chariots. We know you don't travel with horses. You travel with wear wind. How, how did you know that technology? At that time. If I leave you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. We know you. You can't be trapped. You are like the wind. Meanwhile, this is what Jesus was telling us in John chapter 3. That as the wind blew it. Before Jesus said it, Elijah was walking in it. Moving like the whirlwind. It's a heritage. Aeons before Jesus came. It's a cause to be normal. a cause. That's why everything overwhelms us. Everything wearies us out. We don't know what we have been called into. We have been summoned into that which is as ancient as God. And there are testimonies to that effect. When the New Testament story began, the standard was never lowered. The Bible spoke concerning Peter. A point came, there was no need praying for the sick put them on the streets. When they come out of the prayer hall, you know, that's why I tell our generation, prayer is not about sweating. It's about tapping into your heritage in Christ. When these men went to pray, if they come out, it's not they sweat on their suit. When you pray, you will sweat. But they came with the witness of heaven. In Acts 5.15, they put the sick on the road. Who told them? That means if you have somebody in the hospital and they told you Peter is coming, quickly go and discharge him. Today, they will tell you, doctors will tell you, don't hear what any pastor tells you. We are advising you, better take your drug and if you try it, you will see something. But in the days of Peter, when he's passing, they will carry people from the village, put them on the street. He doesn't need to lay hands. When his shadow touches them, whatever they call that sickness, it is cleansed. Yeah. 
They knew something. They had something. Paul was speaking in 2 Corinthians 11 from verse 25. He had suffered shipwreck three times. Paul said, a day and a half, I was in the deep. The man fell into the river. He refused to die. He became like an aquatic creature. A day and a half, I was in the deep. He cheated death because he carried something that could tell death, go back. But here we are every day. Somebody said we will die. We already have high blood pressure. But these were men that defied death. When he couldn't walk, they, they gathered him physically, stoned him to death. The Bible said the believers stood around him. He stood up. He said, let's go to the next city. What did they carry? What is in them? I want to tell you what is in them. It's the Holy Ghost. And that is the confidence that we have. If they manifested it, we must manifest it. And we will manifest more. Because the Bible said, behind them is a desolate wilderness. But before them is the garden of the Lord. That means everything they did is a rehearsal for what we will do. A generation is about to rise that will walk in the order that Christ himself walked in. Because he said, the works that I do, he said, you shall do also. He said, and greater works than this shall ye do. In John 7, 38 and 39, he said, on the last day of the feast, which was the greatest day, Jesus stood up and cried with a loud voice. He said, they that believe in me, he said, out of their belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Do you know the difference? In their generation, they drew with cups. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3, he said with joy, they drew what? Waters out of the wells of salvation. So everything the Old Testament saints did were the cups of water they drank. We are not drinking cups. We are overflowing rivers from the chambers of our spirit. I prophesy over someone. The testimony of your life will make what Elijah did to be like a joke. Yeah. Very quickly. Let's go into scriptures. And live stories. The Holy Ghost is the river that we must express. And without the Holy Ghost, nothing will flow out of you. Even Jesus, who is the Word, needed the Holy Ghost to manifest. In John chapter 1 from verse 1, he said, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He said, The same was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. The life was the light of men. So four credentials were quoted. Number one, he was God. Number two, creator. Number three, life. Number four, light. But he didn't do anything until Matthew chapter 3 from verse 15 to 17. He came to be baptized. John told him, no, I should be baptized of you. Suffer it to be so for now. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And as he was baptized, coming out of the water praying, he said the spirit alighted upon him like a dove in the fashion of a dove. And a voice spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Mark 1, 12, Matthew 4, 1, Luke 4, 1. The spirit drove him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Luke 4, 14, he returned in the power of the spirit he returned the river had been installed the river was about to flow immediately he entered the synagogue look for 18 the spirit of the lord is upon me for he has anointed me and he began to show us chambers to preach the gospel to the poor 
He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. When the Holy Ghost comes, he becomes the river flowing from within your spirit. And for those of us who are in the order of Christ, when the Holy Ghost comes, the river he flows from our spirit are number one, all the realities of Christ. Everything that is of Christ, that's what the Holy Ghost brings out from us. Because when he comes, number one, he installs Jesus in you. The Holy Ghost has two primary assignments in the life of the believer. Number one is to install Christ in you so that Christ becomes your software. That's why I began by telling you that Christ in you is the hope of glory. That's what the Holy Ghost came to do. Your operating system was death. When the Holy Ghost came into you, he came to introduce a new software into your spirit. And that software is Christ. And then the second thing he does is to cause Christ to flow out of you. That's why Paul said, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. So when we see you, you should be a reflection of a dimension of Christ. So the first river that flows out of you is the essence of Christ that the Holy Ghost installs and conducts through you. And if you study your Bible, you'll find a few of them. Number one of the essence of Christ that the Holy Ghost installs and flows out of you is called eternal life. That means the life that now powers you is not the life of your blood. Listen, man is created a strange creature. Man is the only creature that has three lives walking in him at the same time. There is the animal life in your blood. Leviticus 17:11. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So anybody that has flesh has life inside the blood. And that's why when you go to the hospital and they take your blood sample, they can get every information about your flesh. But that's not all the life you have. Genesis 2:7. God breathed into his nostril and the man became a living soul. There is the soulish life in your breath. That's the life that gives you understanding. But that's not all there is. Because in Genesis 2.9, God planted a tree of life in the midst of the garden, which is the spirit life. That's the one the devil stopped him from eating. But what the Holy Ghost does is that when he installs Christ in you, the life of Christ now flows through you. So in 1 John 5, 11 to 13, he said, this is the record. He said, God has given unto us eternal life. He said, that life is in his son. He said, whoever has the son has life. He said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know that you have everlasting life. So the key is for you to know that there is a new life on your inside. Most of us are trying to function by the ecosystem of the fleshly life. So when men struggle, we struggle with them. What you don't know is that God expects that when the animal life fails, when the soulish life fails, you switch to the superior life, the zoe of God. And when I was reading and studying about eternal life, I thought eternal life just gives you capacities. So you can't fall sick. If you are sick, you receive healing. I thought those was were the things eternal life does. When I now study the epistemology of eternal life, I now discover eternal life is not just about doing things. Eternal life is actually the life of an age. There is a life that powers this age. When the Bible speaks of eternal life, he's talking about a life that powers the age of God. When we are raptured, the world we are going into, that's the life that will sponsor it. That's what God has given us now so that even before that age comes, we begin to taste of it. Now, the age that is to come, men don't fall sick. That's why if you have eternal life, you can live above sickness because eternal life brings a new civilization to your realm. In the age that is to come, men don't die. That's why now that you have eternal life, even when your body fails, you transition. 
because there's no death in that age. There's no sickness. So what God was doing was to bring us into a civilization that is yet to come. So by implication, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. This is why when men in this world are failing, it becomes an error for you to fail because you have a life that powers another aeon. It is the reality of that aeon that should power you. Do you know that in the world to come, they don't need aeroplanes? So when the Bible tells you Philip was carried, Acts 8, 39, he's telling you the operation of eternal life. So while you are here, if you need to drive, you can drive. But if there's no car, you can't be stranded. I'm telling you this so that you know where we are compared to where we should be. See, Jesus travels in boats. He preaches in boats. But the Bible said on one occasion, he went to the mountain to pray and the boat had gone. At the third watch, suddenly they found him walking on water. He was walking on water. And they saw him. They said, he is a ghost. You know why they said that? Because they know spirits live above this realm. So eternal life actually brings us to an order that is superior to this realm. And Jesus said, fear not, it is I. Peter said, if it is thou, bid me come. And Jesus told him, it's not exclusive to me. Come. 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 And Peter thought it was a joke. He stepped out and suddenly the water became frozen. And Peter was walking. Peter was walking. If he kept his gaze on Christ, where the reality came, he would have walked. But he turned back to the world and saw the boy stereos win and entered his soul. That's why when you talk these things, men can't believe. They are in their head. We are functioning from our spirit. It's another aeon superimposed into this aeon. God wants you to live heaven on earth. That's why he gave you eternal life. Did you see Jesus? 5,000 men needed food. And the people walking from their brain said, Sir, don't ask for food. You will stir their appetite. Don't ask. It's a risk to ask. He said, give them something. They said, Sir, a year's wages can't help in this matter. You have preached well for three days. Let them pray in tongues and go home. He said, they will faint on the road. Give them something. They said, well, since you are insisting, it's only a young boy's lunch that is here. Five loaves, two fish. He said, bring it. There is a realm of sowing and reaping. Practice that realm. But there's another realm where you sow from where you didn't reap. Where you reap from where you didn't sow. <laughs> and Jesus said, bring it. And they brought it. He lifted it to heaven. I thank you, oh Father, that you always hear me. Take, give them. What have you done? I, I was wondering what would be on the face of the one who collected it. <laughs> give who? You want me to rob this little boy? I said, give them. They broke it when they gave, they check, it grew. They broke it, they gave, when they check, it grew. What are you saying? Does bread multiply? In the world where we come from, they don't plant there, yet there is food. They don't sow there, yet there is abundance. Because when you come into eternal life, you come into an aeon that is to come. God is not telling you to be irresponsible now. Sow and reap now. But in case it does not work, there's a technology of Rehoboth. Because it's not about the land. It's about who is digging. It's about what he carries. Because when Jacob dug well and they collect it, it dries. He moves, digs another. They collect it, it dries. They now discover the well is not about the location. It's about what who is digging carries. When you carry eternal life, you have entered another aeon. When men fail, refuse to fail. There is a technology on my inside. When God gave me eternal life, he installed heaven on my inside. And when I show up, heaven shows up. I can install heaven in the earth. Rivers. But we have not let it. We have studied too much English. We have studied too much physics. We have studied too much chemistry. We have studied too much sociology. We need to go back to Christology, to pneumatology, to ecclesiology. We need to go back to eschatology. We need to go back to theology of the spirit. There are other syllables beyond the mind. He said concerning the princes of this realm, they know not. Neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. He said, but I have said, ye are gods because you are the children of the most high. He said, but you fall 
like one of the princes. Listen, you will not fall. As you walk out of this conference, the river of life begins to flow through you. Look at the audacity Jesus had. They told him, John 11, your friend, the one you love, Lazarus, is dead. <laughs> Jesus looked at them. He said, these people with their human terminologies, what is dead? I don't know what that means. He relaxed. Four days later, I said, let's go. They said, go where? They say he's dead. It means the chapter has closed. He said, no, he's asleep. In the realm where we come from, people sleep in glory. They don't die. You are reading it to think it's a storybook. That's the reality we've been called into. And when Jesus shows up, Martha met him. If you were here, our brother would not have died. He thought it's about healing. He said, there's something superior to healing. I'm talking life. I'm talking a realm where death does not exist. The same thing Martha said. Mary said the same thing. That means they were operating at the same theology level. Jesus said, where did they keep him? They say, ah, this is four days. The brain decays after 30 minutes. Don't go there. We trust you as a prophet, but don't disgrace yourself. I say, where did you keep him? And when they brought him, the Bible said, Jesus looked up. No rehearsal. He said, roll away the stone. <laughs> if you were there, you would say, Master, can I advise? If you stop now, it's still okay. I say, roll away the stone. And the guy rolling it, I could imagine what was going through his head. And when he rolled away the stone, Jesus didn't even do the courtesy of praying under his breath. At least if you pray under your breath, if it doesn't work, you say, I'm asking God to receive his soul. I thank you, O oh Father, that you always hear me. Lazarus, come forth. The Bible said, he that was dead came back. You know what? See, human terminology constant, but a superior realm. Him that was dead came back to life. That means he brought a superior dimension and forced the lower dimension to comply. That's eternal life. When the Holy Ghost installed Christ in you, he installed Christ so that this life can come into you. This is not being a church member. This is carrying something that is ancient. Nothing in you dies from tonight. Nothing you touch fails from tonight. Nothing overwhelms you from tonight. In the name of Jesus. I tell my people, function like men because you are still in your body. But when the principles of men fail, change gear. Out of my belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out of my belly shall flow rivers, rivers of living waters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody didn't know he was carrying this all the while. That's why when you are complaining, the angels are wondering. The Bible said the angels were trying to peep to see what the prophets prophesied about. Because when they perceived of the excellency, they were wild. So a generation is coming that will defy death. A generation is coming that will defy failure. A generation is coming that will de defy defeat. And you showed up, you never knew that you carried it. That's why that river must flow tonight. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. So let it flow right here, right now. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. Let it flow, let it flow. So let it flow right here, right now. Let me say two more. Please sit for a moment. Our time is fast spent. The second thing that was installed in you in Christ is called righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him that was without sin to become sin for us that we might become. He didn't say we will have. We become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
What's the purpose of righteousness? See, one of the things righteousness does for you is that when you comply with the word and the spirit, you will live above sin. But the thing is beyond sin. Sin is one of the things that righteousness empowers you to overcome. In 1 John 3, 7, he said, My little children, let no man deceive you. He said, Him that doeth righteousness is righteous. In verse 10, he said, In this are the children of God made manifest from the children of the devil. So righteousness should make you live above sin, but it's beyond it. In Romans 5, 17, he said, They which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they reign. So righteousness makes you reign in life. He gives you the authority of a king. Do you know why God is right all the time? It's because of righteousness. If God looks at you and you are shocked, he says, Tom, how are you doing? Go and check the mirror. You'll be shocked that you are a Tom. You didn't discover it. Because he can't err. Righteousness is actually a power that makes anything you do or say to be so all right. That's what God gave us. That's why he said, they that have righteousness a abundance of grace must follow it because without the abundance of grace righteousness can be righteousness the grace supports what you do to be correct so a man who is righteous can show up in a wedding feast and they say water is finished he said it's not my time yet oh. they say no 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 they need wine they need wine wine is finished he said okay fill those water pots when they filled it no prayer take it to the governor that's righteousness at work the water we have to comply because everything created has an intelligence when a righteous man approaches it he superimposes that intelligence and when the king drank it he said ah people bring the best wine at the beginning why did you keep the best for the last they didn't know what was happening a righteous man made that water to become wine that's reigning in life reigning in life is coming to a state where nothing subdues you rather you subdue all things and that's what God installed into us so that when we talk even creation will obey we have the power to change things to align with the will and purpose of God without righteousness it will be impossible what makes us kings is righteousness the moment righteousness comes into you and you begin to live it out, you discover that there's a level of authority you begin to wield. That's why those who understand and live righteousness, they cannot but reign. It brings you into power of rulership. And that's not all. When the Holy Ghost came, another technology of Christ that he gave us is the mind of Christ. We know, not just because we read. Listen, we read. We study to show ourselves approved. But in case we have not read, when it is time to talk, we open our mouths, wars come. He said, we have not received the spirit that is of this world. 1 Corinthians 2, 12 to 14. But the spirit that is of God. He said, therefore we know the things that are given to us by God. He said, which things we speak. Not with words that human wisdom teaches. There's no philosophy that can teach it. There's no sociology that can teach it. There's no chemistry or physics that can teach it. He said, it's the Holy Ghost that teaches it. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He said, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Neither can he know them. They are spiritually discerned. He went to verse 16. He said, but you judge all things because you have the mind of Christ. There is a mind in your head. There's another mind in your heart. The mind in your heart is called the mind of Christ. It was installed in you when the Holy Ghost came. See, that's why if you don't allow the Holy Ghost flow, you are cheating yourself. When the Holy Ghost begins to flow, it makes you to become like a visible expression of Christ. And the apostles walked in this realm. In 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In John, 1 John 4, 17, he said, as he is, so are we, not in heaven, in this world. Because we have cooperated with the Holy Ghost to download, to install, and to express everything of Christ that, we, that he has. This is Christianity. Christianity is not a religion. It is divinity expressed through humanity. And for that to happen, you must begin to allow the Holy Ghost to install and to manifest the dimensions of Christ in and through your life. 
you have the life of God. You have the righteousness of God. You are not ordinary. You have things from Christ that are your true wealth. Your wealth is not in a bank. Bank can't contain what you have. If a bank can contain your wealth, you are poor. The things we have in the bank are byproducts of our true wealth. My wealth is the life of God. My wealth is the righteousness of Christ. My wealth is the mind of Christ. Throw me anywhere, I will make him part. There is an intelligence that is beyond what mental power can achieve. Go and check. Most of the inventors of the early generation, they were men who knew Jesus. Does it not surprise you? How many first century, how, most of the inventors you know when you study school, how many of them did you hear that they are from other religion? Because these things are downloaded. They are downloaded. It's now that they have opened the space that others can access. The mind of Christ. These are the rivers of your spirit. And that's not all. Hmm. There is the anointing of Christ that is on your life now. Acts 10, 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. What were you anointed with? Acts 1, 8. Not many days from now, you too shall be anointed with what? The Holy Ghost and power. There's an anointing on your life. You are the one who is not aware. If you know what you carry, you will know that demons are afraid of you. You know the, the irony of this thing? God knows we are powerful beings because he put something on us. Angels know because they are aware. Even demons know. The only people who don't know are the ones who have it. You are the only one who don't know you are anointed. You. You are the only one who don't know. God knows. Angels know. Demons know. You don't know. Come on! Somebody shout! Now you know! <laughs> I don't have time. Very quickly, let me show you how to let it flow. Because I told you, at first you need to know what you have. Then you let it flow. So now when you are engaging the things I will show you, you will not just be carried away by the euphoria. See, prayer is sweet when you break through. Oh my God, those of you who know, you know. When you break through in prayer, you become volatile. If you are not careful, you will be carried away. He must take it. He carry a papa. No, that's not what you focus. There's what they call prophetic fixation. You can be lost in the realm, focusing on the wrong things. This is why you need to know truth, so that when you enter the realm, you will stay where you need to stay. That's maturity. You catch it there and keep it. When you come out, you come with it. So when you come out of prayer, the glory of your life increase. Because when you were praying, you were interacting with glory, not your emotion. He said as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. He knew what he was looking for. Worship is sweet. You are hearing, doing sing song, you are weeping. That's good. But the song is a vehicle. You want to hold something. That's what you are focusing on. So while your emotion is being serviced, you are traveling. Because something must break forth. And by the time it breaks forth, you will know. How do you let it flow? Number one, you must yield. When the Holy Ghost came on Jesus, Matthew 3, 17, the Bible said, the spirit, I like the way it was put in Mark 1, 12. Matthew 4, 1, Luke 4, 1 said he was led. Mark 1, 12 said the spirit drove him, drove him into the wilderness drove him. If you want to release what you carry, because now we are dealing with people who have the Holy Spirit. We want to show you how to release the powers of the Spirit. He will drive you. He will drive you. There are times when for weeks it looks like eating before six is a sin. It's the driver walking through your soul because a season has come. You are pregnant. Travail must happen for something to be born. There are times when for months to talk looks like an iniquity. You won't find anywhere that is written. 
that don't talk. But you will know that if you talk, something will go wrong. You will find out that you are empty. Because the pressure of the spirit that is designed to drive you came with a law. He drives you through laws, counsels, and consecrations. So those who understand the drivings of the spirit, when they sense those promptings, their job is to yield. Because if you don't yield, you will quench the spirit. That's why Paul counseled, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. Too many are quenching the spirit. In the night, 1 a.m., you wake up, you don't know why. You are being driven. You notice the pattern is consistent for three days. Or God sets an alarm. Because after one week, you won't wake up again. And what you will not realize is that a cycle has passed. Maybe it will come back in five years. You, you are the one who thinks your age is 35. Your age is not 35. Your age is six cycles. Because your cycles come every six years. And some people have missed all those cycles. It's called Kairos moments. The Kronos moment is designed to prepare for the Kairos moment. The Kairos moment is what determines your age. Some of us have 12 cycles in our lifetime. Some have 5. Some have 15. If you don't maximize it, have you not noticed? Some of you, it's every 4 years that you go to a revival meeting. Or you meet a prophet. Or you have an encounter. It happened to you when you were in, primary, in, in, in SS2. It happened to you now you are in 300 level. It happened to you third year in work. And you think these are common. You are not sensitive. You don't know that cycles are happening. The world is designed to work in seasons and cycles. Corn doesn't grow every time. Mango does not produce every time. That is the same way your spiritual dimensions are not activated every time. What the Holy Ghost does is that he carries you through trainings. Either through the church you attend, the pastors that mentor you, until the season comes, then the driver shows up. And then all of a sudden, you start sensing that all your salary, you should give it to the orphanage or give it for church project. And you're wondering, why, why, why? It doesn't happen all the time. You are being driven. Because the Holy Ghost wants to bring you to a corner where your spirit depends on him only. And everything that will be a distraction, he will take you away from it. Some of you is movies, some is food, some is money. He will drive you away from all of those things. Even Jesus, the Son of God, had to be taken to the wilderness. The idea of the wilderness is not for you to suffer. He said he suffered them to hunger so that they may know that man shall not live by bread alone. It's a training to help you trust and depend on God because you have found the comfort zone. And in that comfort zone, the river can flow. So the Holy Ghost will make sure he takes you away from the comfort zone so that the waters of life can gush out. This is why the Bible said, they that believe, out of their belly shall flow rivers. But you have not seen anyone. The reason is because rivers flow after you are driven. When Jesus yielded, Matthew 4.1, Matthew 4.15, he said, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentile, the people that sat in darkness, they have seen a great light. This man is 30 years old. He has walked these borders before. What happened? You must be driven before the waters break forth. He returned in the power of the Spirit. The power was there, but you won't return in that power until you have paid the price of yieldedness. Those are the days when your pride will be crushed. Those are the days when your confidence in the flesh will be crushed. And like Paul, you will say, we are the circumcision that worship God in the Spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus having no confidence in the flesh. The Holy Ghost will become your weapon. But you must be driven. The second thing that makes for the release of the Spirit is to tarry in His presence. Because after you are driven, you will now discover that a second law will be given to you to remain there. Acts 4, 26-31 the apostles were driven, they were in the upper room until the day of the outpouring. After the outpouring, the Sanhedrin show, showed up, arrested them, and flogged them thoroughly. Their confidence depleted. They knew that they had to go back to Tari. Because what we cause those cycles to now begin to repeat is the power of Tari. And in Acts 4, 29, 30, the Bible said, after they tarried, it said the place where they were was shaking. They were filled with the Holy Ghost again, and they spoke with boldness. Verse 33 said, with great power, the God gave the apostles witness of the resurrection 
great grace was upon them. If you can't tarry, you can't release life. Jesus, Matthew 17, from verse 2 to 4, he went to the mountain. The Bible said, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. His raiment began to glister. It's like refinery. Those of us who study chemistry, it's, it's a fractionating tower kind of thing. The crude oil is there. Just hit it. When you hit it for a while, everything will start going up. At different boiling points, they will separate into mist. You will cool it and collect it. So something will separate at 60 degrees, turn to, 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 to vapor. You will collect it on the other side, cool it and collect it. Another one is at 80. Another one is at 100. That's how those rivers open. Wisdom for you may take 40 degrees, but favor may take 90. So you can know everything. You are talking. People say, Kai, this guy is a bit something. So. But nobody will be led to bless you. Because you are operating at the heat frequency of wisdom. You have not entered favor. So when, 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 when Paul was advising, he said, you dearly beloved. He said, building up yourself upon your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Everything you have is in the technology of faith. He said, but it will take prayer for it to distill so that it becomes experiential reality. Tarry! Otherwise, the realities of God will be mixed in you as crude. Wisdom and favor and power is all junk together. No one is manifesting. It's when you tarry that they separate into different fractions. And those fractions are the things that will change your destiny. So if you want the river to flow, you must tarry. Those of us who go, uh, Father, we love you and sleep. <laughs> you will see that your younger brothers that you supported with school fees will pass. Their generation will separate them. You will be angry with God, but it won't change your story. If you want your story to be changed, you will stay on the altar. Your knee will become like a camel. Pray there, sleep there, wake up there, pray again. Can we rise up? Let it flow, let it flow. Hey. Let it flow, let it flow. You must squeeze out these things from your spirit. Too much is locked there. Now, after you tarry, number three, you take steps of faith. Oh, man, know it not thou that faith without works is there. Thou believest that there's only one God. Thou doest where? The devil also believes and trembles, but faith without works is there. After you tarry, instructions will come. Step out. Only those who walk out see the glory of God. It's a day that journey to the deep. They are the ones that see the wonders of God. You don't pray for the sick, you will not find healing. You don't go for evangelism, you will not know what of knowledge. You don't give, you will not know abundance. You must take steps of faith if the river will flow. And finally, allow yourself to be inspired that those who have gone ahead of you. You say, follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. If they have obtained before, they can show you the way. Hey, they can show you. I know the things that happened to me because I focused on Bishop Oedeko. I know the things that happened to me because I focused on Pastor Chris. They were troubled. See, those who trained us, they trained us with three things. Prayer and fasting, the word and stories. Those days, if you hear some stories, you, you food, appetite will die. I heard of the story of a man, a saint called Dennis. Saint Dennis. He was so crazy about so winning. He was going, they cut off his head. The story said he carried his head on his hand and he trekked for several miles preaching. Where he fell down was where they built the cathedral. They cut a head, the head of a man. He carried the head. The head was preaching. Jesus. <laughs> Those were the kind of things they were telling us. I heard the story of St. Anthony of Padua that 30 years after he died, his tongue was still fresh. I said what? They say he was a rugged preacher. The day he died, all the bells in the cathedrals in Padua were ringing on their own and children were wailing because one who carried witness has departed. Can you hear such stories and sleep? That's why some of us told God, if we will preach, we must preach with fire that a man's tongue didn't decay. The things they touched, a generation will rise. And you are part of that army. You are part of that army. You didn't come here just to hear and to see men shine. 
You came here because there is a shine on your inside that must manifest. Can we pray for one minute? Come on, somebody who is there. Mahele Kepakatoa. Zezene Manteria. Ragabada Sada Lelila Hatuas. Parito, Tafapali, Lakaya, Zebayanda, Marande, Duas, 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 Lele, Kaina, Bella, Kura, Kata, Hazete, Satatana. Somebody else is coming up and we'll have time to worship and pray. But please hear me. Everything I've shared here is for Christians, those who have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, don't be excited. I'm not talking to you. You are making a mistake. Oh, an anointing will fall here this night. Too. There's an anointing. Ancient dimensions, ancient mantles, ancient oracles. People will rise here as custodians. Custodians, custodians. Witnesses are coming, oh, witnesses. He said, You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels. Witnesses are coming to the earth. We are about to enter the last phase, and a new kind of Christianity will begin. Ah. Let's do what's important. Don't worry, when Dusin comes up, we can press in. If you are here and you have not publicly confess Jesus as your Lord you have missed out meanwhile I didn't talk about the second river the second river are the rivers of your spirit like love, patience kindness, mercy consecration, but I don't have time for that notwithstanding if we know this one is enough if you are hearing me now you have not made Jesus your Lord and Savior please lift your right hand you can't escape this moment lift that hand up, be bold about it Lift that hand up. I want to surrender now. Wherever those hands are lifted, run to the front now. This is your moment. Run here now. Thank you for watching this video to the end. I know you have been blessed powerfully by that message. Remember to subscribe to this channel. Turn on the post notification bell so that each time we release any content at all, you'll be notified. Don't miss out on any of our videos. Stay tuned on this channel. Share this message with your families, your friends, your loved ones, and anybody at all that you know. Keep the faith alive. Keep the fire burning. God bless you. See you in our next video. Cheers.